Hello, everybody. Today we're taking a look at broadsides and boarding parties. And this is a personal favorite tabletop game of mine. Milton Bradley released this in 1984 as part of their Games Master series, which also included the likes of ANA, Fortress America, Shogun, Samurai Swords, and Conquest of the Empire. Now, Broadsides was the only title in the MB Games Master series that was generally not well received. It was absolutely beautiful and totally impressive from an artistic point of view. So yes, it had an over-the-top appearance, but that meant it was also fiddly to set up. That's an understatement. It was often irritating to actually play, and I mean to literally manipulate the pieces during gameplay. And quite frankly, most people believed it was too simple, too light of a gaming experience to justify its unprecedented asking price. And I'm talking, let's say, at least $80 Canadian in 1984, if I remember correctly. And at that time, other board games might cost, you know, 10 to $15. And I remember I saw it in a store called Leisure World as a kid. Anyway, to put that in perspective, it, that would be equivalent to adjusted for inflation, maybe $190 today at least. So the point is, it was always expensive. And when word got out, it was nothing more than a kid's game with small, fiddly, breakable pieces. It was no wonder parents passed on this big time. And with most teenagers really not buying it, broadsides and boarding parties vanished from stores seemingly overnight so really it was a shame it was understandable though now fast forward like 15 years with the advent of ebay and other similar online auction sites people like me got a second chance at owning the game even if the copies were no longer new used you could find one online for about 130 dollars about 20 years ago so that's when i got mine uh the early 2000s the one i bought was in okay shape but now people are asking over $200 for a complete game online. The question now is simple. Is it worth it? Is it worth the hassle? Is it worth the money? What if you really want original copies of the game's master series and need broadsides and boarding parties to complete your collection, for example? Well, I say yes. Yes, it is worth it. If you're willing to implement an essential fix that is easy to do to put in place. Absolutely, I know how to fix this game, honestly. I'll show you how to do it. Uh, no more pirates tumbling across your ship decks, washing out gameplay, no masts getting knocked over and pieces flying everywhere. In addition, BGG modders and fans over the years have come up with some awesome rules adjustments and upgrades so that you can turn your broadsides game into more of a thinking strategic experience with all kinds of new variables to add. If you're one of those people that demand more substance to justify the cost of getting yourself a copy, I got you covered with this video. As always, you just have to be receptive to house rules and be open-minded about the whole modding scene. So we have to begin by addressing the worst feature of this whole setup, that every single detractor and hater of the game absolutely bemoans. And we have to do this even before mentioning anything about rules and gameplay. Otherwise, people won't believe the game is even fixable. So we know the game comes with two, what look to be about one to 120 scale ship models with playable components, removable masts, cannons, and little crew minis. They look awesome set up, but the minis tend to slide all over the ship decks, making a mess. And this surface isn't even close to being level on the aft section of the models. The huge masts get in the way when reaching in to manipulate the minis so that inevitably you knock into one of these huge things with your hands and wash out your ship with tumbling pirates. And this happens every game, usually multiple times. It's super annoying. I've seen people online 
install magnets on pirates and metal tacks on the ships to fix this problem. And that's one way to do it, I suppose. It seems like a lot of work. So I'm guessing most people haven't done this. They probably just choose to play some other game instead. <laughs> but you can fix your broadsides and boarding parties game easily with this poster tack. And no, this isn't a commercial for that brand or whatever. I don't care about them. Any tack product you can find on any office supply store will do here. Um, and this stuff is intended to be an alternative to tape or thumbtacks that damage drywall. But it turns out it can also fix your old board games too. So all you need to do is apply a tiny amount of tack to the underside of each of your pirate minis and cannons, if you like, to anchor all your units in place. And you can even put a tiny piece between the main mass sections to prevent that rig from crashing down from an accidental knock. I recommend using less tack per piece than you might expect is necessary to do the job because if you use too much, individual pieces might start sticking to each other and you don't want that either. So as a general rule, if you can see the tack from the top or hanging off an edge of plastic, it's probably too much. Now, I know what you're thinking. Won't it mar up the cardboard or stain it over time? It will do that to posters eventually, but you aren't hanging a poster. After you finish playing, just store your minis in a plastic bag and don't leave them stuck on your ships and you'll be all right. So my ship decks are fine. You can see there's no damage from the poster tack to report. So what about the gameplay criticisms? They all seem to stem from the prevailing attitude among haters that this is child's play or at best a beer and pretzels experience for adults. And that terminology was first applied to broadsides and boarding parties. In fact, as far as I can tell, if it was used prior to that, I never heard it. Anyway, it's fair. It doesn't mean the game overall can't be fun. It can be. It's just really basic. The designers, I think, made it this way on purpose to make the player experience more tolerable. Given all the problems with it we just covered, they probably thought we'll make it short. Hopefully people don't check out before they actually finish their games. But today we fix it. Everything's all right now. Now we are free to layer in all sorts of different rules modifications to broadsides and boarding parties to make it even more worth your while. Before we do this, let's quickly get some potential component upgrades out of the way. The game comes with a deck of plotting cards that players use to move their ships. They work well enough as a game mechanic, but they're not high quality and they won't survive long without sleeves or lamination. So make sure you protect the wimpy original cardstock. I laminated mine. The game comes with two plain boring D6s. Lose them if you can. They do absolutely nothing for the immersion factor of the game, which is otherwise really high. So I went with a set of pirate dice from an unpopular, way less expensive French board game called Piratology. And these are very the very best piratey dice I could find for sale online. And you'd be surprised how much fun they are to roll. The skeleton face is a six result in case you're wondering. And it's really fun to get that grinning face too from a 1d6 roll action. Anyway, uh, there are many other pirate style dice out there too. All of them are better than what comes with the original game. So you might consider that upgrade. I also swapped in the mini boat pieces from Piratology. They look like they're actually catching wind power and they are a lot more colorful than the ships that come with the original game. They are slightly tippy though. Now onto the rules. So for the uninitiated, the first part of the game takes place on a beautiful sea map. One of the best examples of weathered artwork you're ever going to see in a game, in my opinion. And this is covered with a grid of possible navigation points. Players reveal their plot cards simultaneously. One card represents one movement phase order out of three per round of movement. So you can move forward from one dot to another, or you can choose to remain in place or rotate 45 degrees to port or starboard in each phase. The goal is to close within one dot of your opponent so you can fire cannons at an optimal angle of attack. System works fine, uh, but you aren't sailing in my opinion. It doesn't feel like ship movement at all to me. 
So when people say the game is too simple, they must be referring to this aspect of the game, at least in part, I would think. The mini ship models you get for the sea map are cool enough, but they move like they look and feel, kind of like tanks or maybe like a school bus. You just plod forward, drive around. There's no sense of sailing or real seaborne navigation or adventure. There's no wind variable. There's no midnight rains upon the ocean as the poem goes. Steady is the bark's proud motion. Yeah, well, that's missing here. Unless you had an actual sailing feature to broadsides without ruining the lightweight intent of the original design. So five years ago, a BGG user named Triple W Daigo came up with the answer. The Daigo wind and sails model that is available online is just perfect in my opinion. It's unbelievable. Honestly, I was skeptical initially until I actually delved into it and played it myself. So if you're a real fan of this game, consider this mod. And I'll briefly highlight some of its best features. But for those of you who are serious about the finer details, I encourage you to check out the file for yourself on BGG. So in a nutshell, the wind model allows for more than one dot of forward movement per forward movement card if you are taking advantage of the wind. And that's it, really. First, you establish north, then with a die roll or with the use of a spinner, that's what I use. You set the wind direction before each round of plotting, and then you move only after you choose one of three sail configurations, furled, half, or full. And there's a handy diagram and chart that explains the advantages and disadvantages of sail positions in relation to wind direction and also with respect to cannonball damage, which we will look at a bit later. And I'll just give one example of this so you can actually get a better sense of how intuitive the whole thing is. And one thing to note is also that no matter what sail position you are in, you can never move forward directly against the wind. So that's a real issue sometimes to overcome. You really have to think about how you're going to maneuver your ship when suddenly faced with adverse sailing conditions. If you're furled, okay, the best you can do is two dots forward per card at a 45 degree angle, and that is called closed hauled tack toward the wind. Unfortunately, being furled means you can't pull away if the wind is at your back. It's really not that confusing. Running downwind with full sails, conversely, gives you two or three dots per forward movement card, in addition to a bonus 45 degree angle turn action if you want. Another cool thing about this mod is the bonus wind advantage moves are mostly optional, so you don't have to take them. You could remain fairly predictable until conditions seem just right for a power move. So keep the wind direction diagram handy, along with the sail position chart that that's all you need right there. And just these two pieces of information is all that it takes. And I also printed off an arrow graphic. So I had something to lay directly on the map next to a ship to make plotting easier. So once you get used to the wind and sails rules, you'll discover that in practice, what this all means is you really have to think about the position of your ship in relation to the wind, especially after the first plot card is played. In other words, you're actually planning and using your brain during this part of the game. Much of your movement allowance usually gets taken up adjusting the heading of your ship, just so you can take advantage of the wind with a final sweeping movement that hopefully rewards you with a true broadside shot. I love this mod. You could strip parts away too, if the entire thing isn't to your liking maybe delete sail positions, maybe just establish wind heading, say a bonus move with it, a penalty if you try to move against it, something like that, it's up to you. Anything a little more involved will be better than the original movement rules, in my opinion. So the second mod, which I really like, is related to the first one, and it's another great idea. Since we have opened up the ship movement component of the game, why not open up cannon ranges as well? And honestly, I never really liked how cannons fired with one dot range. It meant in practice, and this is with more than a few games played too, so I'm speaking from experience. Usually just two, one, or zero opportunities to actually fire your big guns against your opponent before the two ships crashed into each other. So yeah, tight ranges, 
basically guaranteed boarding actions, therefore really short games. But that could be a bummer if you're here for ship-to-ship -ship tactical over hand-to-hand -hand combat. Anyway, Daigo's Wind and Sails mod also just assumes cannon range is adjusted to two. It is reduced to one, however, if you're firing directly into the wind, and it's expanded to three if you are firing directly downwind. Another thing you can do is to fix ship gun accuracy and damage effects in relation to range. And I created a series of simple charts for players to consult that resolve these variables with D6 and D8 rolls. The charts look like this. Range one is exactly the same as original rules. You aim at specific sections of the target ship and roll a 1D6 to locate the damage, if any. You will recognize this chart, except I use an additional separate roll to determine specific casualties if more than one type of thing is hit in a section. Everything in this section isn't wiped out in my game. Maybe it's just crew or maybe a cannon, but not both. At range two, it's slightly different. Each gun rolls a 1d6 simply determine if the shot is generally on target. A one to two result is a near miss, so nothing happens. A three to six is a hit, so then you consult a range two hit location chart because there's no aiming at range two. And you need a 1d8 here to locate the hit section, A through H. And then the normal 1d6 roll gives a more precise damage type or location. And like before, if there are multiple unit types in that spot, another roll determines what gets hit. It's going to be something, just not everything. And at range three, there is a 50% chance a cannon shot is off target. If you do get a hit, it's the same process as before, no aiming, plus there's no hull damage. And that doesn't count at range three. So this is all optional. I like it though, it draws out the ship action it encourages more movement on the big map, and it means that you can slug it out at range if you want to avoid boarding parties before the time is right. So go ahead and try a variable ship damage model. It can be more involved without being too complicated. You can also be more flexible with the actual configuration of your ship. In unmodified broadsides, the crew minis aren't supposed to move at all. During the traditional naval combat part of the game, they're far too small and awkward to handle and manage for that. But since ours are anchored now, that's not the case anymore. So as a final step of every turn, immediately after each round of ship movement, why not give each player three action points to redeploy or reorganize their crews? And this is the same rule that is applied during a boarding party action that we'll see later. Apply the same thing as a final step in naval combat. A single crew mini could move three squares or three minis could move one square each, for example. Say that each mini represents like three or four guys, so only one unit is needed to be in the same location as a cannon to fire it and or accrue the position. If your men are spread out, you don't take punishing losses with every single hit. Losses accumulate half as fast this way. I also reworked hull damage effects to sync up with this new ability of crewmates to freely move around their ship decks. So I say if you get a hull hit, drop a hull hit marker on the section as per normal procedure. I think that's a two result in a 1d6, but the way I have it is as follows. By the end of each turn, one crew unit must be on the hit marker to manage the flooding. That's all they're doing. They can't both crew a cannon and manage damage at the same time. So a cannon position with damage would need two crew in it to fire the cannon. If at the start of a turn, any hull damage counter is not covered by a crew unit, there is a minus one plot card penalty as seawater rushes in. Also, if a crew unit is working on hull damage in a section that is hit again with hull damage, add another hull damage counter and kill the crew in the section so that two more units would be needed to manage the bigger hole in the ship. Three uncovered hull damage markers means the ship is dead in the water. A fourth uncovered hole sinks the ship. At the end of each turn, you could give each crew working on damage a 1d6 roll to repair or remove a hull damage marker. Like on a six result, the hole is patched. At least this way you have a playable damage control model. It feels like you're trying to plug holes in a leaky dam with your fingers, whereas in the original rules, it's more like a damage track that you can't influence. Six, six, six hits total in three sections of the ship and it's game over with the original rules.
So you can see every aspect of the damage model in this game can be fine-tuned and improved, in my opinion. For instance, Daigo's Wind and Sails upgrade reworks Mast Hit Effects 2 in a way that I like. Make a simple chart like this. If your masts get hit and you have furled sails, a 4 to 6 result on a 1d6 roll means no damage. At half sails, I say 5 to 6 is no damage. Daigo just says 6. I'll leave it up to you to decide which makes more sense. But we both agree that a mast hit does full damage if a ship is at full sails. No defensive rules allowed there. Now, let's take a closer look at the masts themselves. They are really cool overall, but I just don't know what's up with those bow sprite things that come with the game. They look like this, and they just lay on the, the very front of the ship. Honestly, these things bothered me as much as uh, Midway Island in original ANA and X-Wing Fighters in Star Wars Risk. You'd have to see my other videos on those games to see what I mean. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is why? Why, why, why are these things not playable? They're in the box. For decoration? Really? Okay, well, I use mine. They count as masts. They, well, that means you have four, four masts, not three. That means if you have a mast completely destroyed, you still have three left, which means three plot cards. When you lose two masts, that's when you drop to two plot cards. You can also say if you lose the bow sprite, the penalty for the rest of the game is that you are only allowed just one 45 degree turn card per round of plotting for the remainder of the game. With four masts, you could also use something known as the mast advantage rule. I really like using this also. The mast advantage rule states that if at any time you have a numerical mast advantage over your opponent on the next plotting phase, the ship with the least amount of masts must lay down its plot cards first. So the ship with more masts gets to react to the disadvantaged ship's intended movement. This advantage can be lost, of course, if the advantaged ship loses a mast and both ships go back to having the same number of working sails again. So that's a pretty fun rule you can also try. Now you might think with all these revisions and extra allowances for movement and everything, boarding party actions, the other half of the game, will become more rare, if not irrelevant. And that's not what I've seen. From my experiences with the modifications, I still get the vast majority of games ending with boarding party actions. Sometimes this is out of frustration too because lining up and landing cannon salvos is tricky with adjusted rules. So it's not uncommon to see bull versus matador type maneuvers that eventually see the two ships colliding. I don't agree with the original rules, however, which demand an automatic boarding action as a result of a collision. If both parties want a hand-to-hand -hand finale, then yes, of course, but not if the collision is purely accidental or one side wants it and the other side doesn't. So if both sides decline to board after a collision, make a simple damage chart for each ship to roll on before continuing on with regular movement from the same dot on the map. My collision chart is simple. It just looks like this. It's a 1d6 roll. A one result is no damage. Uh, two to five is one hull damage, and a six is two hull damage. You could use a 1d8 roll to randomly locate the hull damage as well if you want. And finally, if one side wants it and the other side doesn't, then each player rolls a 1d6. The ship with more crew gets a plus one to their 1d6 roll. A tie result is considered a collision with no boarding opportunity. So the ship with the higher 1d6 outcome gets the result it wants. If this means no boarding action, then both ships still roll on the collision table. If it means a boarding action, then resolve the game with the original hand-to-hand -hand rules. Save for one extra little detail, I think everyone should try. And Daigo's setup provides rules for pistols, and it's a really fun option. I further tweak them a tiny bit, so here's how they work. I just cut tiny strips from colored labels and stuck them on the bases of three crew units per side. I did this because I didn't want to use paint. And anyway, I gave each captain a strip and then two units from both sides, a strip of color. I say these units represent the captains with their two officers or lieutenants. And these are the only units that are allowed to carry pistols. So lieutenants can stand in place and at the cost of one movement 
or action point, they can fire into an adjacent square. They roll a 1d6. The defender rolls a 1d6. If the officer gets a higher die result, the target unit is shot down. A tie means nothing happens. A captain carries two pistols. They roll two d6s, so they get two chances to get a higher single die result than their target's 1d6. Defense roll. Double pistols cost two action points, however. And finally, since pistols were difficult to reload, no unit can fire pistols more than one time in a turn. So yeah, I really like the boarding party actions in this game. They are brutal, fast, and simple dice-offs between surviving crew units. I only use this one rule adjustment for this aspect of the game. You could think of more. But I think this part is already really fun, tense, and exciting. Heavily luck-dependent, yeah, but... I don't care, it's a great way to end the game. And so before I wind up this video, I'll also propose a final idea, a bonus feature a friend and I came up with one day after playing a really fun round of this. We were looking at the map and just thought, wow, you know, there's so much stuff going on there with all its cool detail, pictures and themes and features. It just begged for more story elements. So we sat for a couple of hours and brainstormed some random events players might deploy to encourage more playthroughs. And after we had some ideas down, I spent the next few days fleshing them out in my spare time until I had an adventure chart that we could roll on if we wanted to randomly introduce different story elements to a modified game of broadside. So I made a chart. You could also use a deck of cards for this. Uh, you roll to see what happens. We have like 12 different scenarios so far. So we have rules for random environmental perils. I made tokens to represent storms that move around the map, whirlpools, the flying Dutchman, and this is an indestructible ghost ship that moves around and attacks anything that comes near it, except if you pass directly through it, it dissipates and gives your captain and ship extra power. So we put a chip under the captain so he gets two hit strength points, and also your ship can no longer take hull damage. So some silly stuff, why not? We have standard battle rules, except that a Kraken is active on the board too. And the Kraken moves first, two dots in a random direction. If it hits a ship, it attaches with 1d8 number of tentacles that each do hull damage every turn if they can't be shot off with ship cannons. The fight with the Kraken also locks your ship in place. We have rules for VIP passengers, like you could have a doctor on board who has a chance of healing units, a master shipwright who has a better chance of repairing hull damage, blacksmiths for cannons, repair rolls, stuff like that. Um, we also have Spanish galleon versus raider scenarios where the Spanish ship gets chips under each cannon. So it's actually double strength, 10 guns per side with the standard crew versus the pirate ship in addition to a pirate skiff loaded with crew that doesn't have guns, it just wants to crash into and board the galleon. So you don't really need an extra ship model. Just give the skiff a damage track with hull hits that also kills off crew every time it takes damage. So you can use cubes for extra crew if you don't have uh, extra minis. So what else? Uh, we made use of the islands. We have scenarios where they have forts with cannon and crews that you could take over rescue missions, everything. So yeah, you can probably tell by now that I pretty much love this game. Uh, not so much on modified, and it's an original form, but with mods, it's great. Now, like a true pirate, should you pay an arm and a leg for it? Not necessarily, consider worn or busted copies. If you think about it, you could save some money cobbling partial games together. It's kind of a pain in the butt, Still, you could improvise like I do too. Uh, get one without dice, one missing instructions, so what? Missing plot cards, they aren't anything special. Hull damage markers are nothing special. A couple of broken masks, okay, you can glue those. A worn or caved in box. If the price is right, I'm interested. If more than one person in your group has parts or a full game, you could even try the ultimate experience, like a four ships on one map or something like that. Now that would be awesome. So hopefully I've convinced you to take another look at this one of a kind, super rare grail game. Play standard rules with some patience. 
and you'll have some fun. If you're into mods, then I suggest gradually layering in different variables. Don't try everything all at once. See what you like and just go with that stuff. Either way, broadsides and boarding parties never fails to entertain. And I really hope one day you get a chance to try it out with a fellow gamer who appreciates the old school ways. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for more content coming soon.